44 seconds of logos. Comcast. My husband used to tell me I have an overactive imagination. Huh, that's funny. My wife used to tell me that movies didn't always begin with overactive narration. So you can see the irony. I mean, haven't you ever been on a train and wondered about the lives of the people who live near the tracks? I mean, I guess. I didn't know you could make a whole movie about it. I suppose I started noticing her about a year ago. Or whenever she began prancing around the balcony of her house in super skimpy bedroom attire. Also, discount Jennifer Lawrence really f***ing looks like Jennifer Lawrence. Like, I feel bad for her that genetically she's stuck looking like another actress that got famous a few years earlier than she did. Also, also, I just realized this movie is a mass transit-based rear window, and that honestly kind of pisses me off. She became important to me. Me too! I mean, look at her! I mean, I'm not attracted to her or anything, I'm just a third-party observer. Observing her balconiness and nothing else. She's what I lost. She's everything I want to be. What's truly amazing is this chick is always outside. At the exact times Rachel passes by on the train in order for her to construct narratives about a stranger. Chances are you'd see this woman like twice a month, if that. It's daytime again, and I just now realize this movie's doing some kind of stream of consciousness thing regarding her commute. But you can't blame me for expecting a regular narrative. After three confusing passes by the not Jennifer Lawrence's house, movie decides to adopt a traditional narrative and starts following Emily Blunt's day. Movie seriously needs to pick a direction and go with it already. I imagine she's a painter. This is one of those book adaptations where the characters have to read the book aloud for you to understand what's going on, isn't it? Also, she just drew Heath Ledger and Michelle Williams, and you will never convince me otherwise. I wonder what they say to each other before they go to sleep. They say, I wonder if some creepy-ass chick on the train that passes our house is obsessed with us. Ah, surely not. That's what they say. If only they knew. Train visible house sex. I used to live two doors down. Sudden reveal that you used to live next door to this house your train stalking is sudden. Every day I tell myself not to look. Because they're always ready with personally painful things to show her in the window no matter what time of day she rides past them. Oh, my baby's so cute. Oh. Lady, you said that shit before you even got a look at that baby. You are a phony, you phony. So sweet. How, how old is he? Six months. As if the slurred speech and probable liquor breath weren't enough for this woman, she gets an orgy of evidence that Rachel is a lush by seeing the mini bar on her lap. Where'd that recent mother go? Did she imagine her? Or did that lady disappear quickly and quietly? Or does the movie want to tie us up in worrying about this so we miss the larger story points? Girl on a train sips a thing, and I'm ready to roll credits, man. No lie. Megan. I mean, what the f***? A teacher once told me I was a mistress of self-reinvention. Huh, that's funny. My auto mechanic once told me that movies don't overstress self-narration, so you can see the irony. Movie does nothing but f*** with me for seven minutes and then throws me directly into a therapy session. I tend to smile when I'm nervous. Sometimes I laugh. Sometimes I wear a sexy white dress to therapy. For a year, Mac and I lived in this hunting cabin. Look, just because you're saying this to a psychologist does not make it not narration. We started f***ing. Oh, go on. You were saying? God damn it, stop introducing girls! I went and I brought you back to bed with me. And when I was feeding you, we heard Daddy singing from the kitchen, didn't we? Narrating life to your toddler. Another gallery had hunted me. This might be the cockiest sounding thing ever said in a movie. Another gallery had hunted you? So you're so f***ing awesome at, I presume, picking paintings that go together for exhibits that you're being headhunted frequently? This movie wants me to hate this girl, right? Because I do. Rachel, what are you doing? Give me my baby. Gotta say, I've read the book and I know what this scene means in context and still, watching this movie is confusing as sh Ah, roses for the wife. Who did you f on the way home today? IVF rarely works the first time. Easy ass baby related marriage tension backstory is easy ass. I wonder what she's looking at. Megan has set the record, in 19 minutes, mind you, for number of times out on her deck or backyard at any given time for anyone in the history of the world. Movie firmly establishes Rachel's alcoholism, but hardly any reason to keep watching the movie. Anna, I fell asleep last night thinking of you. Who's Anna again? Is she the pretty blonde or the other pretty blonde? Or wait, is she another woman? I think this movie did show us an Anna title card a minute ago, but who the f*** knows who's who? I realized that they were kisses, not exes, and my husband was f Century 21, <laughs> Now, don't you have to either be paid by or pay Century 21 to use their name like this? And given the context, I'm guessing they weren't interested in a paid product placement besmirching their agents. So how did this come to be? I picked everything in the house. I picked everything in the house. Are you mad about the adultery or the wasted interior decorating skills? I just... I'd wrap my hand in her long blonde hair and I'd jerk her head back. I'd just jerk it back. You know, kind of like a certain future murder that's about to happen that will incriminate me. These are lethal, leaving Las Vegas levels of drunken depression depiction. Oh, she's going to go to that house she's been spying on. This movie is a solid PSA for not drinking too much before making drastic life decisions. For this story to happen, we have to have a woman who obsesses over strangers who just happen to live a couple houses away from her old house. The obsession over Megan and her husband Scott is rather remarkable, considering the main fixation is over her ex-husband Tom and his new wife Anna. On the very very day drunken Rachel decides to confront Megan over another man she thinks she saw her with, 
She just happens to be out for a stroll in the neighborhood, and she's about to get murdered by, spoiler alert, someone Rachel knows. Also, continuing more ranting, the whole movie is also possible because she passes out and wakes up alone with some wounds and blood, not knowing what the f happened. F you, movie. I'm not playing your detective games. Just show me the movie and stop f***ing with me. At this point, I'm ready to blame everything here on Ben Affleck, and that just doesn't seem right. Regardless of recent drama, using a smartphone in a tub is just asking for trouble. <laughs> Did that really happen, or was that a dream or fantasy? You don't know. You don't know! You remember when you opened with three women's names and two separate narrations in the first 12 minutes, but then spent the next 20 focusing solely on this one girl? What the f*** was that about? Rachel sees a former friend on this train who is here just at the right time to give proper character development and context via flashbacks. After witnessing this golf club attack from the past, yeah, I think the unreliable narrator thing is in full effect here. Also, even Tiger Woods is jealous of that swing, if only because she didn't break her back and have to withdraw from the tournament despite her wonky swing. Cutting from the golf club attack to her walking at night in the street is basically everything wrong with this movie. And it's f*** you editing and sequencing style. When is this? F*** you. You don't deserve to know. It's my understanding you were fired from that job over a year ago because of your drinking problem. Girl's drinking problem is so bad she has memory issues, calling into question everything I've seen so far, making me think the movie's definition of unreliable narrator is actually a hand-drawn picture of a hand jerking off a middle finger. You don't remember anything, do you? Laura Prepon would be excellent at being a character in Born Ultimatum. Rachel is remembering an embrace between Megan and a man she doesn't know, but there's no way she was able to zoom in to a close-up of that dude, especially after drinking that heavily. It's pretty coincidental, isn't it? You just happen to be on a train at the same exact moment that a woman you don't know but somehow recognize is cheating on her husband? Movie itself would be excellent at cinema scenes. Mrs. Watson reported that you go to their house sometimes uninvited. Only now, after Rachel's run out of the house to specifically tell Detective Riley about Megan's affair, does Riley tell her this. Lying is like taking a trip. Only it's a fake trip where nothing is holy mother of God. What was I talking about? He figures out all my passwords. If you have half a brain, that shouldn't be possible. You Megan's friend? Yes, Rachel. Lying while snooping. Snoop lying. Snoop lioning. I saw your wife with someone on Friday morning. None of this seems weird to Scott, a random woman coming to his house who feels compelled to meet in person to tell him something that, from his perspective, she apparently did not tell the police. The alcoholic chick who might already be drinking again is definitely drinking again. This should make her even more reliable. Is that what you saw? The answer is yes, but there's no way Rachel knows that. I remember, that's him. Bullsh**. Two months ago from four months ago? From present day? From when? Movie doesn't care. Okay, she asks where are you into the phone, and we cut to her having sex in the woods with the dude that we don't get a good enough look at to know who it is. And this is what's wrong with this f***ing tease of a movie! And with that, Megan won the argument, and they immediately boned. Megan, I could lose my practice. With something that comes after this, but not this? For the first time in ages, I have purpose. So I'm playing pool. These people have apparently never heard of phone conversations or simple texts. Why the f*** do they have to keep meeting like this? That dick told them I'm abusive. Well, you probably are, but we only know that from Megan's words, so maybe you aren't. Which is kind of the problem with the cops just accepting everything the therapist says, which is what they appear to have done. When she walked out, I, I didn't go after her. I never called to check on her. Yeah, why is that actually? Is it because this movie wants me to spend time thinking every character in this movie is guilty? I think it is. Yep, that's your ex and his new wife and child. The very reason you were cop ordered to stay away from this street. So why, when leaving Megan's house, did you walk in this direction, you stupid idiot? Do you want to go to jail? Your, your, your wife hit me on Friday night. God damn this movie. Every single thing it shows me, it also wants me to doubt. Just write a good mystery into your script and stop relying on this unreliable character bullshit cheap shot tactic. Gah! You just got Hipwell's house? How the f*** would you know that? You only noticed her when she was standing in the street a minute ago. Has she been back to the house since the incident with your child? Not that I know of. What? Was she not at the house in a scene five minutes ago? I mean, yeah, maybe her husband told her she was at Scott's, but if you're Anna, do you believe for one moment she's at Scott's without an ulterior motive to see Tom? Believe it or not, this is merely the second spouse tries to break into spouse's computer records moment in this film. Reporters from my yard. They're everywhere. I didn't know where else to go. Wow, okay. First of all, how did the reporters not follow you here? Also, did she give this guy her address? Hey, if you ever need to talk about your probably dead wife, you can come by my shitty apartment. Did Megan ever say anything about me to you? She loved you. What the f*** are you doing, lady? You haven't even made two decisions in this movie that make f***ing sense. I brought Libby in with me, put her on my chest. Sudden dead baby story is sudden! Also, this story about how Megan went to sleep in the tub with her kid is heart-wrenching and gives her character some added depth. But at this point, we're far beyond caring about stuff like this. It has nothing to do with the mystery at all. F***ing with the frame rate to try and make me feel tension only makes me upset at you for f***ing with the frame rate. The front door was open, it's not like I broke in. Leaving your front door open in any New York State residence. I know this sounds insane, but I just wanted to hold her. Outside, while walking away from the house. 
Of course, Megan was on the balcony that day, making the appearance that she only makes when Rachel looks at her house. Despite her many connections to this case, Rachel still thinks it's a smart move to show up here right now. It turns out, I'm not the father. Neither is the shrink. Who could it be? Thank you, you know, for getting Abdick to point the finger at me. For getting the cops to say that you and I are f***ing. I feel like maybe this thank you is disingenuous. You want to file a statement? Yeah, here, in the bathroom. But what I'm trying to determine is when your obsession with Mr. Hipwell began. I guess it's natural for someone like Rachel to lie about exactly how she became obsessed with the Hipwells, riding on a train all day, drunk, inventing stories about strangers. But since they now think she's a crazy alcoholic anyway, why can't she just tell the goddamn truth? I need to see you. On the night Megan was murdered, she called someone. I mean, it's a complete mystery using her iPhone. She called somebody's number, something that, if you refer to the detective handbook on page one, paragraph one, sentence one, says, always check who murdered people call on the night of their death. It's a great first rule, something these detectives either pissed on or had Mr. Keating as their teacher during Dead Detective Society. Now that she's joined the audience and not having any idea what's true and what's false, let's have her down some martinis. That'll bring clarity. So now she thinks she did it? She's done a 180 on this thing, and she hasn't been anything but drunk and crazy the whole time. So this is just for the audience, to f*** with them. And now I'm sure this means that she didn't do it, oi. What is wrong with you? Can you stand? <sighs> See, this movie is a dick. Surprise, this guy was super abusive. We just haven't told you that yet, because it wouldn't be a whammy if we did. This movie hides its entire plot behind the thin veil of its protagonist's poor and selective memory. Yeah, Tom got fired because he couldn't keep his dick in his pants. Wait, was Tom fired for sexual harassment or fired for actually having consensual sex with coworkers? Because I'm not sure that's a fireable offense, unless he was a supervisor or something. Anna finds what will soon prove to be Megan's phone, incriminating Tom in the murder plot and proving once again that Justin wasn't thorough enough. Anna rummages through this drawer of wires and finds a compatible charger to Megan's phone in world record time. Rachel's down there. By the way, what scenario led to Megan wandering around by the tunnel and Tom driving his car here? This isn't far from their homes, so this isn't like some private meeting spot or something. And I think it's easily walkable distance. But sure makes it harder for an unreliable witness to remember what was going on. Just f*** off, f*** off! No, you f*** off! Remember earlier when we saw Rachel and the red-haired dude seemingly following her? Yeah, he was this far away from her. Now, she eventually went off the beaten path, but this movie is saying that in the time it took her to go to the tunnel, yell at Megan, and get assaulted by Tom, that he didn't see any of that sh this movie should have been called The Girl Who Only Makes Bad Decisions. If you look in the background of this movie, a train is seemingly passing by in every scene. Having waited for tons of trains in the New York area, I can tell you that the sheer amount of trains coming and going in this movie is the stuff of pure fantasy orgasms. With you, I found Megan's phone. I found it. If he did kill Megan, but kept her phone, he's stupider than Affleck in Gone Girl. <laughs> when you call 911, they pretty much instantly know where you are but this movie will make it seem like all is lost when Tom turns the phone off. Also, whatever happened to 911 operators having to call back when they get hung up on? Because he totally hung up right after the operator said, what is the nature of your emergency? And she told me that you were fired because you were f***ing everyone in the office! And you were warned about that, Tom. Stop f***ing everybody. None of these women can control themselves around you. Also, how many diseases and kids does this guy have anyway? And is his dick made of chocolate dipped cherries or something? I just want to go to the woods. Some place secluded and foggy where you can kill me and dispose of my body with no witnesses. I'm pregnant. There's a chance it could be yours. Jesus. Everyone who sleeps with this guy knows how abusive he is. Even if only emotionally. Why would you spring life-shattering news about your affair no one knows about on a guy this violent out in the middle of nowhere? I kind of feel like the detectives did a job on this investigation. He's not wearing any gloves or anything. She was his nanny. His former co-workers all think he's a slutty asshole. How is he never even considered a suspect? How is there no DNA evidence? I mean... Last we saw the real-time West Wing lady, she was convinced Rachel did it. In a way, you killed her. This is so laughable it loses all potential sinisteriness. I guess I understand the whole I can't let her tell on me motive for this apparent imminent murder attempt, but does he think his chances of getting away with everything go up or down with more women he slept with dying? I've gotta ask, having seen these kind of choke fests played out in movies time and time again, how the choker doesn't notice the chokey reaching for and acquiring items they can pummel the choker over the head with. Understandably, the Swiss Army brand turned down an invitation to sponsor this scene. Also, I like how she used the corkscrew. I mean, she was in a panic, sure, but there are way better throat-stabbing devices all over that knife. This train is symbolic of all the times Rachel was on a train, and no one in the neighborhood heard or saw any of this. I was obsessed with you, and my ex-husband murdered you, so now visiting your grave makes sense and is in no way creepy. We are tied forever now, the three of us. By Tom's Chlamydia. Anything is possible, because I am not the girl I used to be. Because after all that dramatic sh** and the self-defense co-killing, giving up alcohol was somehow even easier than ever. They called me Mr. Glass. What happened?
happens if the engine stops? We, we all freeze and die. I'm having the worst damn day of my whole damn life! On behalf of the people of Lake Town, I ask that you honor your pledge. I tell you to dump a body in the marsh. You dump him in the marsh. Not where some guy from John Hancock goes every Thursday to get a f***ing blowjob! I imagine she's a painter, he's a doctor or an architect. He was a real artistic guy. Sensitive. Painter. These people are not your enemy. We all have one enemy, and that's snow. Lying is like taking a trip. Only there's no boat, and you don't actually go anywhere. Tommy, how's the peeping? <laughs>